Christian, we have no time left. Um, this talk will be on the neuroendocrine regulation of body weight findings in anorexia and bulimia nervosa. Thank you, Johannes, the audience. Yeah, Johannes already introduced some very important aspects, and one uh, I'd like to come back is uh, Johannes' uh, yeah, favorite, the refusal uh, for uh, maintain a normal body weight. So this is a good connection for my talk. Uh, the, well, the, the new endocrine regulation of body weight, as Johannes told, has made uh, well, a, a huge uh, um, progress in the last 10 years because of uh, the research to find some uh, pharmacological interventions for obesity. And the, well, the, the knowledge uh, which we have in the eating disorders come, is coming from the obesity research, uh, which is much more, uh, yeah, there are much more studies and we uh, have very few studies in the eating disorders. Um, uh, but it's growing steadily and um, so I'd like to, well, uh, present you the, from my, from my point of view, most important data we have so far. But to start uh, with, is I'd like to, well, show you a uh, an overview again of uh, eating disorder symptoms, which for those who are familiar with eating disorders are no surprise, and you, well, you just go through. Eating disorders patients are preoccupied with food. They are hunger, although they do not like to talk about that. Uh, they have very peculiar eating habits. They show signs of depression. They are socially withdrawn. They have a lot of ambition, libido, or initiative. They are often rigid. They are unflexible in their thinking, and they're nervous, and often very restless. And now you, well, we are, we are very uh, familiar with eating disorders, and you know there are some important symptoms missing. Uh, and you're right, the, well, the, 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 the symptoms which um, are missing are uh, very important ones, uh, and these are the, yeah, the body, the, 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 um, the fear of gaining weight, the, the weight phobia, the, the, the disturbances in, in body scheme, and this was just a trick to, well, bring you to what I would like to talk about. These are observations and, and behaviors that have got nothing to do with eating disorders. These are yeah, behaviors that were seen uh, in men, in completely healthy men who have lost uh, about 15-20% in, in a hunger, in a starvation experiment which was done uh, after World War II in the United States by Keyes and colleagues who wanted to test or wanted to know about the effects of starvation in humans. And this is what they found. So the point is that uh, although, uh, well, I have, I think, uh, uh, at, the, at the first, uh, you, you, w you would agree that these are symptoms of eating disorders, uh, but uh, you, we have to know that starvation-induced psychological and physiological alterations cover a substantial part of eating disorder psychopathology. This is to have in mind for my talk. And another thing which is important, that... If you look at uh, some risk factors or the entrance gate for eating disorders, uh, you will see that dieting is a very important factor. This is a very old but very famous study uh, by Patton, and they show that, uh, that they, for the, what, the, what have they done? They have performed a prospective survey in 15 year olds, and they look, okay, uh, do, is there an adolescent dieting at the moment, or is it? not dieting, and then they follow up this group for one year, and they could nicely show that dieting yeah, was an extreme early risk factor to, for developing an eating, disorder, uh, an eating disorder. See, this is 61 to 13 and 98 uh, to 3. So, a little bit, well, it's a little bit tough, but uh, I would say that dieting is a necessary condition to develop in an eating disorder, although we all know that's not a, a sufficient one. 
Okay, this is, uh, um, should make the point is that I would like to uh, show you that uh, the, the process of starvation uh, is r really relevant for the developing or the maintenance, uh, maintenance of eating disorders. And now we're coming to the neuropeptides which are changing during uh, the period of starvation. And now um, uh, the question is, does these changes, does these fasting-induced changes in neuroendocrine signaling underlie e eating disorder pathology, psychopathology? And just to give you the answer, um, uh, at, the, at the beginning, um, almost all, or there are very few uh, well, studies showing uh, the different, uh, uh, almost all studies have shown that uh, neuropeptide alterations apparent during the acute episode uh, when, when a patient is coming uh, to, for inpatient treatment or uh, for uh, outsetting patient, that all these alterations normalize uh, after a recovery of anorexia and bulimia nervosa. Uh, and so far, there is no evidence that uh, patients with eating disorders have a premorbid dysfunction in the neuropeptide regulation. So it's all uh, made by starvation. It's all made by the, perhaps in bulimia, more the, 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 the eating habits, uh, the pathological eating habit, uh, patterns. But, and this is the goal of my talk, I would like you to understand that neuropeptide um, that for the understanding of neuropeptide uh, disturbances during fasting, uh, this, th that this may shed light on why patients cannot easily reverse the illness. And this is uh, the point uh, for the, the, what Johannes uh, said already, that the refusal uh, is a little bit critical. So I'd like to show you that these changes in neuropeptides perhaps make it very difficult for um, patients with anorexia and bulimia to recover. And this is, for, this is very important for your treatment alliance, for the compliance of the patients. If you, can, if you talk to them, just like, I know that it's sometimes very hard, and I know that uh, there are biological reasons that uh, make the, dis the, the situation very problematic, you can strengthen your, your therapeutic alliance. Okay, now this is an, a very brief overview. It's, the systems are much more complex and much more uh, peptides are involved. And I'd like to focus on three which are best investigated. Uh, so these are the signaling pathways of gut-derived peptides, which are ghrelin and peptide YY, and leptin, which is coming from the adipose tissue, uh, in the regulation of food intake and energy expenditure. So we have ghrelin here on this side, and I uh, just distinguish them by uh, are they uh, uh, orexigenic or are they anorexigenic. And ghrelin is uh, um, an orexigenic peptide, and it is built, it is produced in the stomach, uh, and it conveys the information to the um, yeah, central center of food regulation, energy regulation, the hypothalamus, and um, it stimulates appetite, appetite and uh, it increases gastric motility and increases the acid uh, secretion, all that we need uh, if we uh, eat. And we have pep peptide YY. Uh, peptide YY is not as good investigated as ghrelin, so there's a little bit discussion what the effects of peptide YY are, especially in comparison of the uh, peripheral concentration or the uh, central nervous concentration. However, uh, it is, uh, most studies uh, say that it is uh, an anorexigenic peptide. It is spilled in the, uh, in the bowels and it suppresses appetite and it decreases gastric motility. And here we have leptin. Leptin is the well, best investigated peptide so far in, from the three. And we have done some, or most of our own studies uh, on leptin. So leptin is produced in the um, fat mass, in the white adipose tissue. And again, conveys the information to the hypothalamus. Uh, and in, 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 in states of steady weight, the, the leptin concentration in the serum uh, is very is highly correlated with the amount of fat mass and the BMI. And so you can take the blood and measure leptin, and you know about the the, the amount of fat mass and BMI.
if you want to do it. Uh, this changes dramatically in times when uh, the energy intake uh, is, is, is decreasing or increasing. So it's not a steady system, it's, not a, it's, it's dynamically uh, regulated, and this um, perhaps makes some problems, uh, uh, which I would like to show you later, when patients with anorexia gain weight. So in, it's, it's, uh, leptin has got a lot of other uh, um, effects, uh, um, not only in food intake and energy expense, but on uh, more than yeah, well, 10 or 15 uh, effects that uh, and more and more are coming. Uh, one very important is the, uh, the, uh, are, is the effect on the hypothalamus uh, pituitary gonadal axis and leptin, uh, just to say it briefly, is uh, the gate for the restoration of, of, of menses in anorexia. So the leptin has to increase up to a, a certain threshold uh, um, until then the, the menstruation set in again. And so, and if it's not reached the threshold, nothing happens. If the threshold is reached, then some other uh, um, factors have to, uh, well, intervene and ha have to be there. Perhaps uh, the, the time uh, and, and fat mass, uh, then the menstruation comes back. But leptin is the gate. Uh, if leptin is not increased, no menstruation uh, will take place. Okay. Now let's go to uh, bulimia and to PYY and ghrelin. This is a, a very nice study done by Palmiero Montoleone from Italy um, and, uh, in 2005 and, and he investigated these two peptides in bulimia. And he, uh, because these peptides are meal related, uh, um, they well, measured it um, you know, five times, six times after the initiation uh, of, of the meal. Here is PYY. And what you see, this is the, the bulimic women and these are the healthy women. And you see that um, a, a steep increase in PYY levels after or uh, during the meal uh, took place. Um, this sounds logically because uh, uh, PYY is anorexigenic and it is uh, suggested that the, this increase uh, induced meal termination and uh, nicely fit with the, well, the pathological habits of, of bulimic eating, there is no increase and no termination of eating uh, well, is inducted. So this fits very nice uh, with the um, clinic. And just the opposite, the, the ghrelin, which is orogenic, so we have a higher level, and if we eat, yeah, these, uh, these uh, ghrelin concentration drop down. Uh, well, that makes sense again, because uh, the decrease is uh, thought to uh, induce the meal termination. Uh, so increase here, decrease here, and you see the, the, the same problem in the bulimic person, uh, no drop, no decrease in the orogenic signaling. So <clears throat> these two uh, uh, peptides, um, the, the, the abnormal pattern of secretion uh, uh, um, after a meal, well, you could think if you combine these two well, uh, uh, effects, which are, should be there in, in, in healthy people, that this should be, uh, could be a maintaining condition because of a decreased tetite response, which promotes prolonged eating at, uh, binges. However, um, it's not that simple because uh, we don't know if it's not an adaptive mechanism that took place and which is make sense in a physiolog physiological uh, um, uh, way. Uh, then it could be that, um, that these well, secretion patterns uh, could be an aim to counteract disturbance gastric emptying, which yeah, is increased and uh, normalized. So we are not sure about uh, what is uh, uh, the, the effect, uh, actually. However, uh, one is a little bit suspicious that this could be, even if this is the aim, physiologically, could be a side effect and make it difficult uh, for bulimic patients to give up their binge habits. Okay, <clears throat> now coming to anorexia nervosa, and there are e well, very, very few studies on, 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 uh, on PYY in anorexia nervosa. Uh, there's one very recent study um, from MISRA 
and they show that they have shown that, that the anorexogenic signaling uh, is increased in acute anorexia nervosa. So that would make sense in a way that it's hard for yeah, anorexic people to eat because they have an increased tonus of anorexogenic signaling. And this um, increased levels, uh, and this is a little bit, again, what makes me suspicious, is it's really uh, how robust or uh, if this effect is really true. Or, uh, so we have to replicate this and um, think about uh, the meaning behind it. Because this, uh, this increased levels, well, they go back to normal levels after weight recovery. So what we can say is that, that, that there is no premorbid problem in the PYY system. Okay, because they, they are going back to normal. And this has been shown uh, by Kay et al. Uh, long ago that uh, in long-term recovered uh, anorectic patients, uh, the PYY levels are normal. <coughs> uh, however, <coughs> we, it could be that these signaling may enhance weight loss. We have to prove that in future. There are conflicting results, so um, the relevance uh, of PYY uh, in anorexia is still unclear. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, now coming to ghrelin, and to make it short because I'm running out of time, I think, uh, there's uh, a few studies about ghrelin and anorexia nervosa, and uh, physiologically uh, it makes sense that ghrelin, which is orotogenic, is increased in anorexia nervosa and decreased in obesity. Here's obesity, here's anorexia, and these are the controls. And uh, um, they have, a, uh, they have no, nothing, no problem with the uh, meal-related secretion, uh, so that's the difference to the bulimic uh, uh, patients. And again, it is normalized, uh, the increased levels normalized with weight gain. So it seems that these, uh, what, what is uh, yeah, shown here is a normal, and a, a normal physiological adaptation to the uh, starving state, to the starvation state. So the, the clinical relevance is doubtful in the, mo in the moment. However, a ghrelin c uh, can be used or could be used as a potential marker of catabolism. Now coming to leptin, which is my, uh, well, home territory, so a little bit more studies I can show you. Um, yeah, Johannes uh, showed in 1997, one of the first uh, researches that uh, leptin levels in uh, uh, anorectic patients are very low. That makes sen that make, uh, sense in a way that the, the, um, the, the fat mass is... Uh, reduced and um, so that the leptin should be reduced and it comes then in studies which we performed together uh, um, that we found out that uh, um, that well leptin can increase in some patients not in all but in some uh, very very much uh, and, and that in some patients when we reach the target weight uh, when these patients reach target are sometimes much higher than they should be uh, uh, related to their BMI and body fat mass. So the, the BMI is still low compared to controls. It's about yeah, 70, uh, 75, uh, 65, 70, and the leptin levels are much higher than you could expect from, from the actual BMI. Yeah? So we have in some patients and a hyperleptinemia. You can see here, these are the controls, and these are yeah, the, the, the anorectic patient at target weight, and you see that the BMI, of course, is still very low, but the leptin levels are, in comparison, quite high. And the, 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 the question was, uh, is this a rebound phenomenon opposing further weight gain, and is this relevant for our anorectic uh, patients? There's one study uh, performed by Rosenbaum, uh, which give a, uh, g gave us a hint. Um, they, uh, re they investigated men and they have reduced 10% of their weight. Uh, the resting energy expenditures went down, body fat mass went down, went, uh, weight went down, uh, of course. And then they put these, they administered leptin subcutaneously and they reach uh, the levels of pre uh, pre, uh, the pre-weight uh, loss level of leptin. And then they, uh, they, their weight was held up by giving food, just, they, just, they level the weight so it could not drop uh, any further, which is relevant because it could be dangerous yeah, if you give leptin and then let, the, let these uh, um, 
uh, people not eat enough and then they could go down with the weight again so they, they keep it up, their weight was hold up here and what they found that, that they, the, uh, the rest in energy expenditure uh, yes, it was, uh, yeah, was increasing and reached pre-weight loss level again so um, when that was the background of the studies uh, which we performed in anorexia that, and then the hypothesis was that, was that during reduced weight stages normal leptin levels may provoke further weight loss uh, by increasing resting energy expenditure now we have done a, a, a study uh, about this uh, topic and we measured BMI, leptin resting energy expenditure and the uh, uh, leptin receptor which I would like to, to leave out for this talk. Um, maybe you can ask in the discussion. Um, so you see here the, the inpatient weight gain uh, over uh, 12, about 12 weeks. It's steadily nicely increasing and as expected the leptin uh, level is increasing too and reaches here levels of the normal controls and what, what we've done here is then we measured um, resting energy expenditure by uh, indirect calorimetry so that you measure uh, the expenditure um, calculating the intake and out of O2 and CO2 and then you can calculate the, uh, the resting energy expenditure quite it's, it's, it's simple but I can't explain in English okay okay so at the resting energy so the, that the, the, at the expenditures you uh, you, you just spend uh, laying flatly in the bed. No? So, so there's no activities, just resting. Okay. So and what you see here is that uh, in the last uh, uh, quarter uh, of inpatient weight gain, there's a steep increase in resting energy expenditure, uh, and there's a steep, we know that already, in, uh, in leptin. Now, uh, what about the correlation between these two uh, factors? And we have a quite strong correlation between the uh, resting uh, energy expenditure at this discharge and the yeah, delta uh, and uh, between the, the increase in leptin. And this is quite high uh, in 20 patients, quite strong correlation. And of course, we have to control for other factors which may be more uh, uh, yeah, likely to explain this increase and we control for the delta BMI, the delta fat mass, the delta body cell mass and the delta of the receptor and in this regression model which explains 55% of the variance of resting energy expenditure uh, the only factor that remained significant uh, in, this, in this whole model was leptin, the, uh, the increase in leptin so that shows that, that perhaps there is a, a relation between the increase in leptin and the increase in resting energy expenditure. Okay, and uh, I let that out. So what do we know? Why uh, is leptin increasing in uh, in in some patient in some patient that dramatically, and in, 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 in that they reach a hyperleptinemic state? And what we know is that, at, well, at least one quite important factor is the um, the weight gain in the second half of your inpatient uh, treatment. And we have replicated it now uh, three times and it's always the same uh, effect that in the second half, if the, the patients gain a lot of weight in the second half of inpatient treatment, then the leptin is, increases very much. Yeah. And there is a study of Rembrandt, uh, uh, Rembrandt <laughs> Professor Rembrandt, <laughs> Uh, 10 years ago and he showed that without knowing leptin at all they, have, they, they gave more psychological explanations but the effect that the, the curve of, 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 uh, of weight gain was a, a prognostic factor for weight loss or the one year outcome so now we, we knew that high leptin levels, high resting energy expenditure uh, and we, had, we have performed another study uh, w w w that was a pilot study. Um, we looked at uh, 18 uh, patients and we divided them into two groups, in a, a group with remission and a group with relapse. Uh, here given by this BMI that was uh, uh, the remission group and the relapse group. And then we look back in, in our data and uh, uh, see uh, and we wanted to try if there are any, if it has this yeah, remission, relapse, different things, anything to do with the leptin level. And there was quite a strong relationship that the, uh, these, the relapse group had much higher leptin levels than the uh, remission group and that these leptin levels were significantly higher than the normal weight controls, which had a BMI about 22. 
or 20, so much higher than uh, the, uh, the, the group um, at, uh, at discharge, which were here about 17. Uh, and here again uh, in this uh, study that the, the, the uh, increase here in BMI in the second half of intestinal was uh, uh, a predictive increase here in leptin levels. So this shows that uh, uh, perhaps the, the, the leptin at discharge is a good indicator for some problems uh, after discharge. So the, the point is that we, uh, and that is uh, relevant I think to say, we have a quite sophisticated uh, program where we give a lot of support for eating. We control it, we, we make uh, contracts uh, in, a, in a very intensive way in inpatient treatment. And the problem is that we discharge this patient exactly in the moment where the leptin, where the biological system is yeah, just counteracting our weight gain. And then we said, okay, we have reached the target weight, and then you can go leave the intensive treatment setting, and you have to take care of yourself in the outpatient setting. Perhaps this is more relevant than the leptin itself, or just to uh, make it, uh, well, I want, don't want to say that, that, that now we have found the, the reason for relapse and it's leptin, no, so it's not this case. But the, 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 the higher leptin levels in combination with the discharge from an intensive treatment setting may be a problem. Okay, I've said that already. Um, this has been replicated and I'm very glad that it has uh, because it was a very uh, small group uh, by Haas uh, at Alfen Germany and they show the same effect that the delta leptin between uh, these days uh, and the first time and the BMI gain in the, in the following time uh, there was a, a negative correlation. Okay? So that is uh, quite uh, good replicated in one study. Okay, so um, let's summarize this. Um, yeah, the, the, the pronounced weight came in the second, uh, in the second half, or if it's wrong, for inpatient uh, refeeding accounts for supernormal leptin levels uh, at the achievement of target weight, and patients with highest increase in leptin levels have the highest values of resting energy expenditure, and that perhaps this leptin induced increases in uh, area at discharge from inpatient treatment may be a risk factor for earlier relapse. And clinically, that would, it would make sense that, uh, mod that the moderate weight uh, gain in the second half perhaps could reduce this effect, or that you perhaps think about um, um, uh, 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 inpatient treatment, which um, is perhaps uh, where you make a break with the weight gain, perhaps uh, discharge the patients for a time to, to day treatment, and then start again with, uh, with, with weight gain if you have a patient uh, with a high leptin increase. Oh, so we, we, we're trying to do that. The problem is that we don't have good reference value, uh, values uh, for leptin. So you have to, to, well, you, you have to s sort out what is a high leptin level for a patient. And because you don't have pre-morbid leptin levels, it's really hard to say uh, if this, because the intra individual um, variance is quite high in leptin, so it's very hard to say this is one yeah, uh, with a high leptin level. Okay, but this could be uh, future uh, aims to uh, deal with it. So, um, what time? I don't know. Related uh, sym symptoms of findings, nervousness and restlessness. And to make it short, uh, you know already, of course, that uh, anorexic patients have a, a, a lot of patients have really a big problems with physical activity, and this is an obstacle uh, for weight gain in the treatment. And then this study was performed in Marburg, um, in Germany, and it showed that the, the semi-starvation-induced hyperactivity, which rats, rat, rats develop when they are in foot restriction and have a running wheel excess, they run to death which is paradox, but they do it <laughs> because they should, uh, well, sit still in, in a corner and, 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 and uh, yeah, well, not, uh, well, lose much en energy by uh, physical activity, but they do just the opposite. And if you give these rats running, running, running in their running wheel, uh, leptin, they, they stop 
quite immediately and reduces their activity to the baseline level. So this is a, a model which was often used to explain uh, the, uh, the, the high, um, yet yeah, sometimes very excessive exercise in, in uh, anorectic persons. Uh, patients and what we have done, just to make it short, we looked at a lot, uh, different, a uh, lot of different qualities of physical activity because it's not clear what kind of activity is increasing. Some studies uh, look at restlessness, other of nervousness, other make this excessive uh, exercise as a topic. So we we measured them all. Uh, some uh, here with a with, ex, uh, with an objective me measure with accelerometry. Um, which is a little watch and that uh, yeah, counts the, the, the movement. And what we found is that, that in all uh, of these qualities, in all different qualities, leptin significantly uh, accounted for the variance. So in that way, the lower the leptin level was, the higher was the excessive exercise, the, the physical activity, the motor restlessness, and the uh, nervousness or, or, or inner restlessness. And um, so this gives us a hint that the, the same maybe is true uh, for, for humans, uh, what I've shown you in the uh, slide with the, with the red experiment, that um, in acute uh, anorexia nervosa, low leptin concentration may underlie increased levels of activity and restlessness, and besides uh, the mental attitudes, desire to lose weight, biological factors seem to affect the level of physical activity, and this is not uh, completely driven by yeah, uh, uh, the, the will, this is biological underlying factors. Uh, but we have to prove this, of course, in an experiment to give some very uh, active patients leptin, and it's important to say that, uh, the, the, that you have to monitor them very carefully because you have to make sure that the the energy you, you spare, the, 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 the patient spare when you give them leptin and, and reduce the activity is higher than the anorectogenic effects of leptin. So they, perhaps they would, as, uh, would eat less yeah, and spend more energy, uh, resting uh, energy. So it's, a quite, uh, it's not a, 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 an easy experiment, but this should be performed, uh, especially in who are very excessively exercising, in, in which we have a lot of problems in the therapy. Okay, to conclude the, the talk, um, I hope I've shown you that there is substantial evidence that uh, in anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, um, secondary starvation-induced uh, modulation of food intake and energy expenditure um, contribute to the maintenance uh, of abnormal eating patterns uh, and to the uh, resistance to gain or maintain uh, a normal body weight and to treat eating disorders uh, efficiently, uh, effectively, uh, therapeutic interventions should aim to disrupt this vicious circle because I've told you that these are all consequences of the diet of the starvation and not pre-morbidly yeah, problems to disrupt this vicious circle by restoring a regular meal time and a normal body weight and which is not surprising for me when they are emphasizing this uh, uh, have proven well at least in this study by McIntosh but, uh, but also from our own long experience in treating of eating disorders that these interventions are particularly effective uh, to treat uh, anorexia nervosa especially. And another thing which is very important uh, and from, yeah, uh, is that these, if you tell patients uh, in a psychoeducation group and parents uh, all these things I've told you now, then the treatment alliance uh, is strengthened and uh, the, the uh, discontinuation of treatment drops down. And because uh, the, we, we can make it very clear that the difficulties that these patients have to eat normally or gain weight are biological driven at least as a part and that is very um, yeah um, the, the, the very good for the for the patient and for the parents to not struggle with emotions and uh, in, in fights about eating and telling you uh, you don't want to eat, so if you want to, the, you, will, you, you will be healthy and you, the, you, won't, you, ha you won't have to stay in hospital. Okay, thank you.